Hello, friends of the channel and fellow Catholics. I have today for you, tonight, wherever you are, wherever you may be across the world, whatever time you may be listening to this, I have for you a newsletter from Most Holy Trinity Seminary written by Bishop Donald Sanborn. It's a very important newsletter, and it's a very important work that His Excellency has undertaken, which is the training of priests. He's been doing this for many, many years now, and I recommend looking him up and supporting his work. I have shared his work several times on this channel and in other places. I want to read to you a bit of his newsletter, and then I will make some comments upon it afterwards. It's very important that you stick around for all of this. Even if you are not Catholic, it is highly important that you get a proper perspective on the faith and not a perspective given to you by the charlatans that are currently holding the positions of power, at least legally. Without further ado, let me begin reading this. This is the September edition. My dear Catholic people, Bergoglio again attacks the Catholic faith. In a recent interview given while he was at the World Youth Day in Portugal, Bergoglio again took the opportunity to attack those attached to tradition and unchanging Catholic dogma. He was talking to Portuguese members of the Jesuit order. One of the Jesuits complained that he had suffered during a year-long sabbatical in the United States, in which he discovered that many Catholics, and even some American bishops, were criticizing the quote-unquote reign of Bergoglio. Bergoglio responded. He said that there was a, quote, very strong reactionary attitude in the church in America. He termed this attitude as backward. He equated attachment to tradition with ideology. Then here comes the heresy. Quote, I want to remind these people that backwardness is useless, and they must understand that there's a correct evolution in the understanding of questions of faith and morals that allows for doctrine to progress and consolidate over time. End quote. The notion of evolution of dogma is a condemned heresy, condemned by none other than St. Pius X in his Oath Against Modernism and in his encyclical Pascendi. This heresy is the cornerstone of modernism and is the basis of all of the reforms of Vatican II. It calls for a perpetual evolution, not only of dogma and morals, but also of disciplines, liturgy, law, and every other aspect of the Church's essence. Nothing is more the enemy of Roman Catholicism than this idea of evolution of dogma. In another Jesuit interview, Bergoglio spouted yet another heresy of the moral order. He said, quote, According to current Catholic teaching, homosexual people are called to abstinence. Then he added that in his opinion, however, in the church, one should, quote, not be superficial and naive and force people to do things and into behavior for which they are not yet ready or for which they are not capable. People should be accompanied spiritually and pastorally. This requires a high degree of sensitivity and creativity. But everyone, absolutely everyone, is called to live in the church. Never forget that. End quote. It is significant that Bergoglio places opposition between spiritual accompaniment and abstinence from all sexual activity. In traditional moral theology, the Catholic priest must inform a person inclined to unnatural sex acts that he must abstain from all activity. He encourages him to avoid all occasions of sin and to confess without delay if he should fall into sin. Is this not spiritual direction? In so many words, Bergoglio has given license to sodomites to practice sodomy but at the same time to be under the spiritual accompaniment of a priest. But what can the priest tell such a person in spiritual accompaniment except what I just said, 
that is, the traditional moral teaching and pastoral practice of the church. Bergoglio used this phrase of spiritual accompaniment in Amoris Laetitia, in which he made the case for justifying both adultery and fornicatory concubinage, each with spiritual accompaniment. It effectively means that despite your sins, the priest gives you sacraments. Bergoglio also said that sensitivity to homosexuality varies according to, quote, historical circumstances. He complained that in the past, sins of impurity were examined with, quote, a magnifying glass, and that in the church, other sins were not important. Only sins, quote, below the belt were relevant, as he put it. He said that the church in the past had no care for the exploitation of workers, for example. It cared only about sexual sins. Of course, this accusation is not true. Two of the four sins which cry to heaven for vengeance, listed in traditional Catholic catechisms, are none other than to cheat workers of their pay and to oppress the poor. Hardly an insensitivity to the oppression of workers. Coincidentally, the sin of sodomy is also listed among these. So one could hardly accuse the church of insensitivity to crimes of injustice against workers and the poor. In addition, Pope Leo XIII addressed the condition of the working man in his encyclical, Rerum Novarum, and Pope Pius XI reiterated these concerns in his encyclical, Quadragissimo Anno. Catholic theologians as well wrote many books on the subject of the abuses of both liberal capitalism and of socialism and communism. Once again, Bergoglio shows himself as ignorant of both Catholic magisterium and Catholic theology. Novus Ordo Cardinal Burke recently wrote an introduction to a book entitled the Synodal Process is a Pandora's Box, by José Antonio Llorita and Julio Loredo de Isquio. In this introduction, the cardinal severely criticizes the notion of synodality, that is, the process of forming doctrines, moral teachings, and practices based on the preferences of bishops, clergy, and laypeople. This is in contrast to the traditional method of the Church, which is to draw these things from sacred scripture, and tradition, as well as from previously existing magisterium. An example of this radically new way has been seen in Germany, where a synod has called for reforms, which are blatantly contrary to the church's teaching. The fear is that what has happened in Germany will spread everywhere. Cardinal Burke states, synodality and its adjective, synodal, have become slogans, behind which a revolution is at work, to change radically the Church's self-understanding in accordance with a contemporary ideology which denies much of what the Church has always taught and practiced." End quote. He notes that the Vatican II dogmatic constitution on the Church makes no mention of synodality. He also mentioned that similar concerns have been voiced by other prominent cardinals citing the late Novus Ordo Cardinal Pell of Melbourne, Australia, who said, quote, Synodality has developed into a toxic nightmare. Novus Ordo Cardinal Gerard Mueller called the synodal path a, quote, hostile takeover of the Church of Jesus Christ. He also said concerning the promotion of the synodal process, quote, if they succeed, it will be the end of the Catholic Church. He added, quote, And we must resist it, like the old heretics of the Arianism. What planet have these Novus Ordo prelates been living on? The hostile takeover of the Catholic Church began in 1958 with the election of John XXIII, exactly 65 years ago. These people are talking as though no substantial changes have been made to Roman Catholicism until synodality. 
notice that Cardinal Burke cites Vatican II. Perhaps he is right that the term does not appear in that document. The fact, however, that he would look to that council for orthodoxy shows that he understands absolutely nothing about what has happened to the Catholic Church. Synodality, taken as Cardinal Burke means it, is merely a natural outgrowth of the defection from the faith which took place in that wicked assembly. In fact, the Council does mention the Synod of Bishops in paragraph 5 of the document entitled Christus Dominus, which treats of the role of bishops. In addition, a number of synods were conducted after the Council, 16 to be exact, from 1967 to 2023. Cardinal Burke misses the whole point. There is absolutely nothing wrong with the Synod of Bishops. It is nothing else than an informal council. That the bishops come together and meet with the Pope in a Synod and express their ideas is perfectly normal and even salutary. The point is that the spirit of this new synodality is modernist. Modernism requires that the authority of the Church listen to and learn from not only the bishops, but also laypersons, in order to adjust the dogmas and moral teaching to the general religious experience of the time. The Second Vatican Council also called for councils to be held on the national level, in which both clergy and lay people take part. Again, there is nothing intrinsically wrong with such an idea. What is wrong is that these meetings are loaded with the heresy of modernism. Worse, the supposed Pope is also loaded with the heresy of modernism. To blame the Church's problem on synodality is the same as blaming the glass for the poisonous drink which it contains. The poison is in the drink, not in the glass. So the poison is in the heretical bishops and lay people, not in the meeting or synod which they are having. There is definitely a rising tide of traditionalism, which is a very imperfect word for a generic reaction against modernism in Vatican II. There are all levels and shades of this reaction, however. Most of those reacting still have not perceived that Vatican II is the problem, together with the modernist phony popes who have promulgated all of the errors and heresies which the Catholic faith abhors. Up to now, the reaction of the Novus Ordo conservatives has been nothing but talk. Talk, talk, talk. Blah, blah, blah. So many of them can be seen on YouTube doing just that, pointing out the outrages of the Novus Ordo, which they pepper with complaining and whining and hand-wringing. At the end, you are depressed. It is as if we do not already know that the Novus Ordo is a disaster. It is as if complaining will solve it. It never does. So Vigano talks, Burke talks, Muller talks, Pell talks, Strickland talks, but nothing is done. What needs to be done? I paraphrase the late Father Barbara. Quote, It is necessary to unmask the Novus Ordo hierarchy as a bunch of false shepherds stripped of the authority to rule the Catholic Church because of their intention to promulgate heresy to the Catholic Church. Just as malfeasant, corrupt, and treasonous presidents should be impeached and removed from office, so all the Novus Ordo talkers need to make public accusation of the Novus Ordo hierarchy as a body which is corrupting the Roman Catholic Church with the promulgation of false doctrines, evil liturgical practices, and disciplines which are not in accordance with the Catholic faith. They also need to publicly denounce the Second Vatican Council as an evil and heretical council, an illegitimate council, inasmuch as it had, as its goal, the injection of the heresy of modernism in the Church. Only then will there be some progress in solving the problem in the Church. 
The modernists will continue to go on their merry way for as long as those who have influence and prominence do nothing but talk, whine, complain, and wring his hands. More springtime from Vatican II. The Epic Times recently reported that 75 Catholic Novus Ordo schools will be closing this academic year. Most of the closures have been in major cities. Some of these closures were due to changing demographics, where neighborhoods change in such a way that there is little demand for the Novus Ordo school. But this was not true in all cases. Even in areas where there is a significant Catholic population, their enrollment is down, and they are facing financial difficulties. One of the causes is that the people favor the abandonment of Catholic beliefs in favor of modern trends. In one Novus Ordo school, for example, both parents and students protested the fact that the school did not renew the contracts of four persons who were either openly homosexual or who supported LGBTQ ideology. Some of the students attended the school's prom as same-sex couples and kissed on stage at graduation events. One parent commented, It's like having public school with tuition. The tuition in this school is $18,000 per year. At another school, a lesbian was invited to speak at the graduation, who refers to herself as a big old dyke. Although a group known as the Catholic Action League complained to the archdiocese in which the school was located, no response was received. There is also speculation that the Novus Ordo is selling off these school properties in order to raise funds to pay off debts incurred by lawsuits arising from the immorality of the clergy. One of the closed schools has an estimated real estate value of $32 million. That would pay off a lot of clerical filth. Another piece of springtime news is that the Venerable St. Charles Seminary in Overbrook, a suburb of Philadelphia, is entering its last academic year. Built in stages since the 19th century by the Archbishops of Philadelphia, it is, was, probably the most beautiful seminary building in the United States, sitting on an expansive campus in an exquisite area. I remember visiting it in the late 1970s, when I was impressed by the magnificent Baroque chapel. In a recent photo, I was saddened to see that they had stripped it all down, just as the Calvinists did in the Protestant revolt. But modernism reigns in those buildings, so they would be better torn down than to continue as a house of heresy. The Archdiocese is trying to raise over $50 million for a new seminary, a building in Lower Gwynedd Township, also a suburb of Philadelphia. It will be located on the campus of Gwynedd Mercy University. The information on the internet says that some seminarians may take courses in the university and some secular students may take theology courses in the seminary. I find it rather odd that a seminary should be placed on the same campus as a co-ed university. Will girls be coming over to the seminary to sit in on theology classes next to the seminarians? The demise of St. Charles Seminary's beautiful buildings and campus in Overbrook, and their being replaced by what looks like a card house on a co-ed campus, is so symbolic of the demise of Catholicism in general. When a great edifice falls into ruin, it happens by degrees. A column here, a wall there, until finally it is nothing but rubble. So we see day by day the decline of Catholicism, still very much alive to be sure, but only in tiny groups, meeting in halls, hotels, or sometimes churches, which are usually only a shadow of the former glory of Catholic edifices. What is more to be deplored is the collapse of the true faith in the souls of millions upon millions of those who are Catholic in name, but who belong to a false religion, the Novus Ordo. Cardinal Consolvi, the Secretary of State of Pope Pius VII, 
when threatened by Napoleon that he would destroy the Catholic Church, responded, You will not succeed, Your Majesty. Not even we had been able to do that. Now that is a fabulous article, and apologies if I allowed the humor of the writing to affect me a bit. It's only human, it's only natural. But there are wise words, many wise words, written here by His Excellency, and many of them are overdue in our circles. Not as if anyone has been, of course, neglecting this conversation, but certainly there are many people who do nothing but talk, 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 and talk, and offer nothing but talk. But when the time comes for actions, they are seen to be dullards, <laughs> is the word I would use. Uh, they don't even know history. I think another one of these is that quote-unquote Father Altman, who blames a lot of these issues on a very recent sort of, of people, of new arrivals to the Vatican, rather than placing it where it stands correctly, which is at the feet of Vatican II, which is at the feet of modernism. Something which is very important to remember is that modernism is the amalgamation of all heresies. Modernism's roots lie in the Renaissance. Its philosophical pedigree lies in the Enlightenment and its political birth comes from the French Revolution. Those three eras and those three things created modernism. And it is this problem in which we are having to deal with today. I will be putting the link to Bishop's website, and I will be putting the link to this article as well in the description to this video. Thank you all for listening. I'm sure I probably butchered many words. My Latin is not as good as it will be, and it will be much better in the future. And certainly I can get a little too excited and bumble some words up, but it is only natural at this time of night in which I find myself recording this video. Again, I believe we should all be very confident in expressing ourselves on this matter. All too often, set of vacantists are afraid to express their views to the broader public because they fear being shamed by those they call their friends. We should not be afraid. We hold the truth. We are few. We need to be bold and we need to strike fast and we always need to strike hard. Remember, we must do all that is possible and we must comply constantly with the Holy Ghost who provides us with the fortitude necessary to take on this massive, massive problem. So much more to come, of course, from Bishop Sanborn and maybe some original content from me. Again, I feel very, very happy to spread Bishop's work and I hope he doesn't mind. He probably doesn't even know this exists. None of his priests probably know this exists, but I hope they do not mind that I am spreading his articles. I, I, none of this is original. None of this comes from me. This is, this is from uh, someone who has practiced and someone who has learned and someone who has spent many, many, many decades in the pursuit of excellence, of spiritual and intellectual excellence. So I owe him the world and I owe him my faith and I owe him any intelligence <laughs> that has been born of this barren Polish mind. So thank you, Bishop Sanborn, and thank you all at the Roman Catholic Institute, and thank you to all who are pursuing the path of perfection. It's a hard path, but it's a good path. It is easier to rise from a bed of thorns than a bed of roses, and I'm very happy to lay on the bed of thorns no matter how badly it hurts me or hurts my relationship with those who live in the world. Until next time, my friends, Modern Monarchists tuning out. Take care now. Goodbye, God bless, and good night.